Blog Talk Radio. Good evening. Welcome to Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for this show. This is part 10 of a series of broadcasts we're doing entitled The Diabolical Jesuit Foundations of the New World Order. And yet last time, last uh, Wednesday, we discussed how futurism or dispensational futurism entered into Protestant Christianity. It's literally a Jesuit creation. And the reason the Jesuits found it necessary to create this doctrine or this belief was simply to destroy Protestantism. Protestantism was built on the reality that Revelation chapter 17 and 18 spoke of none other than the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy and the kings or the governments of the world over which she rules. And with that belief, they all came out of the Roman Catholic Church knowing that they no more needed the Pope who they termed Antichrist, and that the Roman Catholic Church was the synagogue of Satan, the root of all evil in Christendom. And they clung to Christ. They read the book, the Bible, for themselves. They came to a mutual and unanimous understanding and preached against Rome ever since. Now, dispensational futurism, the idea that the Pope is not the Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy is not the Antichrist of the Bible, the Roman Catholic Church is not the synagogue of Satan, and that Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years of time, the Protestant Reformation has lost its foundation. Protestantism has literally been destroyed by dispensational futurism. And that's the way the papacy views it. Protestantism now no longer has a legitimate foundation that it is error, gross error, and a tremendous insult to what the papacy declares is the only authority on the earth that can speak for God, and that is the papacy. That the Protestant Reformation was an assault against the very throne of God on the earth the papacy, and that now, having recognized their error and accepted this idea, this Jesuit-fomented idea that Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years of time, thus exonerating the papacy, that it's every Protestant's duty to repudiate the Protestant Reformation, join the ecumenical movement to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church, and that there be one Christianity. Now, John Nelson Darby and C.I. Schofield that made dispensational futurism popular, made it the orthodox teaching in Protestantism today, which could hardly be termed Protestantism anymore. I think they prefer the term uh, ecumenical or evangelical. They have repudiated Protestantism. And this new teaching that came about toward the end of the of the 19th century in the 1880s was denounced by Protestants around the world. They saw it for what it was, a tremendous deception. And we'll pick up now where we left off last time. It says, a Welsh Baptist evangelist, Reverend J.G. Morgan, said, quote, Futurism is of the darkness of hell itself, unquote. Sir Howard Taylor, son of J. Hudson Taylor, said, or excuse me, founder of the China Inland Mission, said, quote, how any Protestant preacher can believe the Roman Catholic-inspired scheme of revelation passes all comprehension. Now, what is the Roman Catholic-inspired scheme of revelation? Well, that... Revelation chapter 17 and 18 does not talk about the papacy, does not describe the papacy as the woman riding the scarlet-colored beast. And that also, Revelation teaches that there will be a thousand years of Jewish reign once God has returned 
the the Jews to the to, to their their ancient homeland in Israel, and becomes their god, and then the Jews rule for a thousand years on the earth. That's what dispensational futurism indicates. Now, dispensational futurism is a colossal fraud, and is still confusing Protestants and sheltering the papacy. Again, it shelters the papacy by shedding the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy and puts it on a single individual just seven years before Christ returns. Our Lord Jesus said not one word of rapturing the church away in secret seven years before his appearing or of his returning the second time to give the world a second chance when all will be converted. This is dispensational futurism that the rapture will take place, the godly will be raptured out, and then return to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Is that what the scripture says? My Bible says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So how does the rapture figure in here? Now, he did say, quote, Behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give to every man according to his work, unquote. That sounds like judgment to me, doesn't it to you? His word tells us that his second advent is in judgment. For he comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them who know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. See 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9 and 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Our Lord never promised any future glory for this world, but only a fiery bath of destruction when all will be destroyed in readiness for the new heavens and the new earth. See 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. All Christless doctrines are false, no matter how many good men and eminent Bible teachers endorse them. That includes dispensational futurism. The the Canadian ICCC ICCC defender of the faith, Dr. T.T. Shield, said, quote, The futurist dispensational doctrines are figments of the imagination. I class them as heresy, unquote. Christ is not coming the second time to give the unsaved a second chance. And a, and a second era of mercy for mankind. When Christ, the day of judgment comes and time ends. See Matthew chapter 13, verse 41 through 43. Romans chapter 8, verse 20 through 26. Chapter 9, verse 28. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2 through 16. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. Most of the Protestant reformers, with Calvin, Augustine, the Puritans, Whitfield, Spurgeon, Warfield, Matthew Henry, all are in the company of renowned Christian men who utterly refuted the false theory of an earthly Jewish kingdom. Okay? Christ is not coming to save the Jews and to rule the world with them for a thousand years. It was considered that Augustine was the most gifted theologian since apostolic days. In his book, The City of God, he so laid the Jewish kingdom ghost that it did not raise its head for hundreds of years and was not revived until Jesuit Ribera. It's all a lie. It's not taught in the scriptures. It's the Jesuits' way, number one, to destroy Protestantism and to elevate the papacy to a global Jewish millennium, the Fourth Reich, many would call it. Now, the Protestant Reformations and the Confessions of Faith, what did the Protestant Reformers say? What were the tenets of their Confessions of Faith? In each one of these confessions of faith, they attack dispensational futurism as a lie. It says, as the Protestant Reformation spread to the various countries of Europe, these nations drew up their own various confessions of faith. 
In the Augsburg Confession of Faith, it says, This German confession was drawn up by Melanchthon and approved by Luther and was submitted to the rulers and emperors of Germany. It became the Confession of Faith in Germany and the Lutheran Church. It, among other things, condemned millennialism as a Jewish opinion, rejecting it along with other Anabaptist notions. The English confessions of Edward VI of England, from this came the 39 articles of the English church and also condemned millennialism in these terms, quote, those who attempt to revive the fable of the, mill- uh, the millenarians oppose the sacred scriptures and throw themselves headlong into Jewish absurdities. Jewish absurdities is how they describe dispensational futurism. The Calvin Institutes. In the chapter on the final resurrection, he wrote, quote, that Satan has endeavored to corrupt the doctrine of the, ref- uh, the resurrection the resurrection of the dead by various fictions, unquote, and adds, quote, that he began to oppose it in the days of Paul, and not long after arose the millenarians who limited Christ's reign to a thousand years. Their fiction is too puerile to, uh, to require a, a, or deserve a refutation, unquote. How about the Belgic Confession? This confession was adopted by Belgium and Holland and regarded the second advent of Christ, and it said, quote, that it will not take place until the full number of the elect is complete, unquote. Thus guards against the premillennial scheme, namely, that there will be people saved after Christ comes for his own. <clears throat> How about the second Helvet uh, confession? This confession was adopted by the followers of the reformer Zwingli and became the confession of Hungary, France, Poland, and Bohemia. It speaks in strong language and states, quote, that we reject the Jewish dreams that there will be before the day of judgment a golden age upon the earth and that the pious will take possession of the kingdoms of the world after their enemies, the ungodly, have been subdued. Unquote. They quoted scriptures against what was called Jewish dreams. And now the Westminster Confession. Quote, We are to believe that at the last day there shall be a general resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust, when they that are found alive in a moment shall be changed, and the selfsame bodies of the dead which are laid in the grave, being then again united with their souls forever, shall be raised by the power of Christ. Immediately after the resurrection shall follow the general and final judgment of the angels and men, the day and the hour whereof no no man knoweth, that all may watch and pray and be ever ready for the coming of the Lord. Unquote. See Acts chapter 24, verses 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 53, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 17, and John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. In the light of the foregoing array of evidence from the Reformation Confessions of Faith, it is evident that there is not one line of support for the dispensational Jewish kingdom heresy, and it is not surprising when it advocates uh, when it advocates, when its advocates attack the ministry, the church, or the den- denomination to which one may belong, says one dispensationalist, quote, "Christendom is dark and a dreadful anomaly. It is the corruption of the very best things, and therefore is the very worst corruption. It is the masterpiece of Satan, the corrupter of the truth of God." and a destroyer of the souls of men. It is a trap, a snare, a stumbling block, the darkest moral blot in the universe of God. It is worse by far than Judaism, worse by far than all the darkest forms of paganism. Then again, referring to the ministry, this same writer says, 
we most certainly should keep clear of the evil of clericalism against this dreadful thing we solemnly warn our readers. No human language could possibly depict the evil of it. Referring to the church, the same writer says, quote, the church has failed utterly. It has fallen from its high and hope position. It is under judgment. It cannot, therefore, be cheered by the church's proper hope, but is threatened by the world's terrible doom, unquote. Again, quote, but alas, the professing church has sunk lower and become darker than even the world itself, unquote. These quotes are taken from the papers of the Lord's Coming by C.H.M. and published by Moody Press, pages 42, uh, 82, and 87. So we see that dispensationalism is directly opposed to the ministry and the denominational church. It is highly defined by Dr. J.G. Voss, quote, as that false system of Bible interpretation by the writings of John Nelson Darby and C.I. Schofield Reference Bible, which divides the history of mankind into seven distinct periods of dispensations and affirms that in each period God deals with the human race on the basis of one specific principle, unquote. Apart from the above, dispensationalism proclaims the restoration of the state of Israel, along with all the trappings of Judaism. Why, when Jesus condemned the religion of the Jews at the time of his first advent, why would he resurrect that after his coming? Dr. Patrick Fairbank states that, quote, this doctrine was foreign to Christian theology during the first 1,700 years of the Christian church's existence, unquote. The fundamental teaching of the New Testament was what led the fathers with one voice and all Christian writers down to the 17th century to reject the Jewish expectation, both of a territorial restoration and of a revived Judaism, unquote. How would they view the creation of the modern nation state of Israel and the fact that Jews are now living in the land, expecting to build their temple and to be, begin animal sacrifices again? They would see it as an abomination, a phony refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel that Christ fulfilled during his ministry 2,000 years ago. They would see it for what it is, a grand deception. I call it the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. The idea of Israel's restoration has been injected into Christian doctrine by an extreme literalistic school of Bible interpreters who, in the words of Gregory of, of Nisa, have, quote, enveloped their heart with the Jewish veil, unquote. The hope of Talmudic, Jude, uh, Israel, Talmudic Israel has become the keystone in the prophetic scheme of modern dispensationalism, as represented by such men as John Nelson Darby and Cyrus I. Schofield. The dispensationalist is blinded to a truth basic in Christian theology, namely that the church is the proper sphere of prophecy. prophecy. The racists among the Bible exegetes make the church a, parent, a, a parenthesis between two Jewish dispensations, namely that of the law and the kingdom. A well-known American dispensationalist, Dr. L. Sperry Chaper, wrote, quote, that after the Christian dispensation has run its course, there will be a regathering of Israel and the restoration of Judaism, unquote, from a book entitled, Dispensationalism by Lorraine Bettner, page 413. I highly recommend that book. The heresy of dispensationalism results from the lack of proper understanding of the nature of the Old Covenant and its relation to the New. The dispensationalists have never properly evaluated the change of government at Calvary. Reverend Clarence Larkin one of the best known of all dispensationalists wrote this, quote, The new covenant has not yet been made. It is to be made with Israel after they get back to their own land. 
It is promised in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 through 37. It is unconditional and will cover the millennium and the new heaven and the new earth, unquote. See Dispensational Truth, page 151. And again, quote, God has been trying to set up a visible kingdom on this earth ever since the creation of man. But when 600 years of the times of the Gentiles had run their course, God again made an attempt to set up his kingdom on earth, and the angel Gabriel announced to many the birth of the king of the Jews. Thirty years later, John the Baptist preached the kingdom is at hand. That is, 30 years after the birth of Jesus Christ, according to the prophecy of Daniel, recorded in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, the 70 weeks of Daniel, Jesus was born after the the three score and two weeks. Knowing that there were seven weeks of years prior to that, he was literally born at the end, or rather at, at, at his time of his baptism, he was baptized at the very end of that 69th week. Okay? So... His ministry began at the 70th week of Daniel, the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. And in the midst of the week, the midst of the week, the last week, the 70th and final week, in the midst of that week of years, that seven-year period of time, in the middle of it, three and a half years into it, he caused the sacrifices and the oblations to cease by giving up his own life and therefore putting an end to all animal sacrifices. There's no more sacrifice for sin. The whole world, according to futurism, dispensational futurism, is looking forward to a re-fulfillment of that prophecy, and it has deceived the whole Christian world. It has become the orthodox teaching in Christianity today. Gabriel announced the birth of the king, and 30 years later, John the Baptist preaching the kingdom is, uh, was preaching that the kingdom of God was at hand. The kingdom manifested, the king manifested, did likewise, that is, Christ himself, and then later by the 12, and then the 70 proclaimed the same thing. But the king was rejected and crucified, and the setting up of the kingdom was postponed, unquote. Do you might imagine from all that that Jesus is not going to establish an earthly kingdom at all, but a heavenly one? Not what he said. My kingdom is not of this world. It's not of this world. Where do we find dispensational futurism in that light? What is the traditional and orthodox position regarding Bible interpretation? This is well stated in the writings of the following. DeWitt wrote, quote, The Old Testament is a great prophecy, a great type of him, capital H, who was to come and has come, unquote. Dr. L. Burkhoff wrote, quote, nation itself was merely a type of the spiritual realities of, the, of a better day and therefore destined to vanish as soon as the antitype made its appearance. The restoration of the ancient theocracy in the future would simply mean the resurrection of the type. He's talking specifically here about two Jewish kingdoms. The first Jewish kingdom was literally a type. The archetype that it preceded was the kingdom of Christ, the invisible, spiritual, heavenly kingdom of Jesus Christ that was opened by Christ himself. He said, behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. Wasn't he literally saying just reach out and touch me? So if Jesus proclaimed himself the king of a new kingdom, 
then why would he reestablish the old kingdom? It simply just does not make sense. Finally, Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, one of the greatest Protestants, Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, quote, in any part of the Christian church, all national distinctions are swept away, and we are no more foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens of the saints and the household of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 through 22. God has leveled the Jews and the Gentiles. He has given us all blessings which belong to Abraham's seed. We are Abraham's seed. If we believe in Jesus, if we are citizens in his kingdom, his heavenly kingdom, if we are of the faith of Jesus, then we are of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we are heirs to the promise. We are Abraham's seed. What need do we have for a Jewish kingdom and a restoration of Judaism? Oh, what a blessing it is that all national and ceremonial distinctions have gone down with the Jews and made them stand in the same class forever, and Christ is all to all who believe in him. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 29. Dr. G. Campbell Morgan wrote, quote, I am convinced that all the promises made to Israel have found, are finding, and will find their fulfillment in the church, the church of Christ. It's a heavenly kingdom. It is true that in the past, in my expositions, I gave a definite place to Israel in the purpose of God. I have now come to the conviction, as I have just said, that it is, a, it is the new and spiritual Israel that is intended. That is the way I believe. That's the way the Bible preaches it and teaches it. For example, he said, quote, The church of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The glorious promises is found in Psalm 72, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 60, verse 63, Ezekiel 37 and 38, Zechariah 10 to 14, prefigure the Lord Jesus and his people in the new Israel, the church, in this Christian era, Acts chapter 4, verse 24 through 25, and 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. God has excommunicated the Jewish nation, and Christ will never again be found in a Jewish temple. You must believe as much at odds as Jesus was with the Jews of his day that he would not restore that error. Created his own kingdom. It's a heavenly kingdom. It's comprised of both Jew and Gentile. He's not ready to recreate that old Jewish kingdom. We've been lied to. It's called dispensational futurism, and it has contaminated all of Christendom today. The whole world has been deceived. The whole world is deceived. And what we need to do is to diligently search the scriptures, come to a uniform and universal knowledge of the truth, and return to Bible Protestantism, and reject dispensational futurism. It is the greatest deception upon Christendom since the Garden of Eden. Dr. Billy Graham said, quote, The Jews are now invited to become members of the household of faith by the gospel of Christ, and there is no racialism, unquote. See Romans chapter 9, verse 6 through 8, and Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 42. But before I leave any discussion, this quote from Billy Graham, let me just tell my listeners that Billy Graham, early in his ministry, knew the truth. But after Vatican Council II, Billy Graham more and more and more became ecumenical until at the end he found no distinction between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. As a matter of fact, Billy Graham said publicly, even a Buddhist or a Muslim 
if he was a good Buddhist or a good Muslim, he too could go to heaven. Billy Graham, before the end of his ministry, was completely destroyed by dispensational futurism and ecumenism, the unification of all the world's religions under one ecclesiastical head, the Pope of Rome. I used to love to listen to Billy Graham when I was a child. But Billy Graham lost his way in the worst way, in the futurist way, in the ecumenical way. He lost his Protestantism. Doctor, or excuse me, Reverend Larry Love of the Billy Graham team said, quote, My approach to Scripture is neither futurist nor dispensational. I am of the Reformed faith. The church was founded in the Garden of Eden when grace was manifested to the sinning pair, unquote. My guess is Reverend Larry Love, if he didn't leave Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, was also perverted by dispensational futurism and ecumenism and united with the Roman Catholic Church, as as was Billy Graham. Professor J.I. Packer of Bristol College says, quote, dispensationalism is a monstrosity, unquote. Dr. H.C. Slade, ex-president of the ICCC, said, quote, The dispensational doctrines do indeed present a serious problem to the Christian churches. Some of these doctrines are nothing short of heresy, unquote. Dr. W. Per- uh, uh, Perkiser, excuse me, of the Pasadena Bible Institute said, Dispensational futurism Dispensational futurism is one of the most ingenious systems of interpretation ever devised to evade the plain statements of God's holy word, unquote. The Open Brethren Evangelical Scholar Professor F.F. F. Bruce wrote, quote, The Darby Schofield influence has not been for the good of the Brethren movement. There are many brethren today who are neither futurists nor dispensationalists. The Schofield Reference Bible is shot through with dispensationalism, unquote. A Baptist minister said from his pulpit, quote, For too long have the Schofieldists been dragging red herrings across our congregations and confusing our church members concerning the second coming of our Lord, unquote. <clears throat> Dr. Philip Morrow, Morrow, an American lawyer, said, quote, Dispensationalism may be fascinating as a work of art, but as a revelation, it rests upon a foundation of sand. The entire system of dispensational teaching is modernistic in the strictest sense. It is modernism, moreover, of a pernicious sort, such that it must have a Bible for its own the Schofield Reference Bible, for the propagation of its peculiar doctrines since they are not found in the Word of God, unquote. It should be quite clear from the above that there's not sufficient scriptural ground for an expectation of a millennium, and the Bible favors the idea that the present spiritual kingdom of God will be followed immediately by the kingdom of God in its consummate and eternal form. The kingdom of Jesus Christ is represented as an eternal and not a temporal kingdom. See Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, Daniel chapter 7, verse 14, Luke chapter 1, verse 33, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, and Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. To enter the kingdom of the future is to enter upon one's eternal state. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 22. To enter life, Matthew chapter 18, verse 8 through 9, and to be saved, Mark chapter 10, verse 25 and 26, and John chapter 3, verse 3. This is the most universal and widely accepted view, and is the only one that is either expressed or implied in the great historical confessions of the true Protestant Church, and has always been the relevant view in Reformed circles. Therefore, let us earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints, and that we may be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. 
Let us not give heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth, but speak the things which become sound doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sound speech, which cannot be condemned. Thus we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and, and, and purify unto himself a peculiar and particular people, zealous of good works. Seeing, therefore, that we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. Hebrew chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. Again, this little booklet is entitled The Origin of Dispensational Futurism and Its Entry into Protestant Christianity, and it literally spells the destruction of Bible-believing Protestantism. True Bible Protestantism. Because of dispensational futurism, Vatican Council II succeeded in drawing all the once Protestant churches back into the Roman Catholic Church and back under the spiritual and temporal authority of the popes. They have once again become slaves of the Antichrist, just as the Israelites wished to become slaves once again of Pharaoh after having been once delivered by Moses. How could it happen? The Protestant Reformation was our deliverance from the modern-day Pharaoh. How could any Protestant wish to return to the slavery of modern Egypt? It's inconceivable what has literally happened, but I'll tell you it's going to have real grave consequences in every Protestant life in this age. The Vatican views dispensational futurism as having been become the orthodox teaching in the once Protestant churches as a virtual surrender to Roman Catholicism an admission that the Protestant Reformation was an error and that it now must be repudiated the Protestants must return to the Roman Catholic Church like the rebels they are and then having returned to the Roman Catholic Church, commit themselves to pay reparations for all that the papacy lost as a result of the Protestant Reformation. Now, what did the papacy lose? All the kingdoms of Europe. Now the papacy wants to be restored as king of kings and lord of lords, not over just Europe, but over Protestant America over the Muslim world, over the Middle East, the South, the North, the West, the whole world. The papacy says, in mimicry of God himself, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. And if we wish to be Christians, quote-unquote Christians, we must come under the Roman pontiff. According to the papal bull, Unum Sanctum, it is absolutely necessary for every man, woman, and child to be subject to the Roman pontiff. That's the New World Order. That is the Jesuit foundations of the New World Order. Couldn't have happened without dispensational futurism. There's only one hope for this world in not consummating this step toward a global religion, a global government, a global economic system, and a global social order under the Pope. And that is to expose the error of dispensational futurism, the very foundation upon which the new world order is established. If in a day all those who once called themselves Protestants return to their Protestant belief, the belief that Revelation chapter 17 and 18 speak of nothing but the papacy and the kings of the earth over who he rules 
and the people that he has deceived, making merchandise of the souls of men, if we would all in a day return to that belief and reject the papacy, this new world order might not happen. But I can tell you, spitting out that frosting-coated futurist lie is very, very difficult. It just tastes too sweet. But it's a lie. It's poison. It's lethal poison. And we need to spit it out. All of it. It's a very difficult thing to unlearn something that has been drummed into your heart and soul for 50 years, as did as, as it was for me. But I have repudiated dispensational futurism, and I have returned to Bible-believing Protestantism, which is built on the foundation that the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church and the kings of the world over which he rules is the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist the woman riding the scarlet colored beast of Revelation chapter 17, and I will not be a part of it. I belong to a heavenly kingdom, not an earthly one. I belong to one that is ruled by Christ himself and not by any who call himself a vicar of Christ. The Jews rejected Jesus. They're planning on making animal sacrifices again pretty much a demonstration that they still reject Jesus as their Messiah. And they're ready to receive another, the Pope of Rome. I thank God for opening my eyes. I thank God for this little book. And I hope each and every one of you will prayerfully consider all that we've talked about on this program in these last ten sessions. And with that, I'll close. We'll see you next time on Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. My name's Tom Press, host of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio, heard Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Central. Tune in. I'll see you.